Calling All Explorers is a podcast from the Harvard Innovation Laboratory in Boston. Your hosts are Harvard Business School alumnus Ronald Terrazas and me, Harvard junior Jessica Pizzolides. Along with Dr. Gordon Chu, we are co-founders of iLab member Fingra, a for-profit public benefit corporation dedicated to discovery, development and commercialization of materials that can transform humanity's ideas of sustainability and ecology. Dr. Chu is our regular guest. He is a globally recognized scientist who is author or co-author of 41 international patents, many dealing with the wonder material graphene. He is a distinguished alumnus of Harvard Business Analytics Program and of Wharton's Advanced Management Program. Hi, Dr. Chu. Hello, Jesse. How, how have you been? Well, today is the first day of December. Whenever we release this, it is the first day. We're recording on the first day of December. Mm -hmm. And I'm great because I came off of a, another radio program that I regularly do. And we were talking about eating goose for instead of turkey for Thanksgiving or the December holiday. I see. Can't quite say I've ever <laughs> tasted goose. You know, goose actually is better for your skin and your aging because it contains some incredible uh, nutrients that only the goose would have. And it's um, it actually lowers cholesterol. And there's all kinds of data sets around having goose. And it's a much more expensive bird. People selling geese actually have, um, I'm not talking about shooting them in the wild, the Canadian goose or anything. That, that, that's a felony. But if you actually raised geese and ate them like they do a lot in the United Kingdom, um, that actually is a prized bird that uh, retails and, and, and wholesales for a lot more than um than than chicken or 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 turkey interesting i actually was not aware of the you know demand for that tremendous demand in fact people have become multi-millionaires selling um goose cuisine we should probably check out the goose market then <laughs> and <laughs> right. your play in there like <laughs> yeah yeah so anything with the g right you know we were talking about miles and so we were off with the s word but but the um but g like g for graphene or goose you know so those might be uh those might be indicators the two gold of, mines of our, right, of gold, our gold, gold is g right yeah yeah <laughs> so um, what a fun day yes Sounds sounds like a great day, but I'd love to talk about just some of, I don't know, the adventure that you've gone on with the applications of re reactive graphene. And I think maybe just as an introduction, could you just tell us exactly what what actually is reactive graphene um, and what makes it what makes it different to, you know, pristine graphene or just like well, pure graphene? Yeah, pristine, pure. Those are the P words. But, you know, the 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 graphene. Graphene comes from um, something called graphite. It doesn't have to be, but it 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 naturally comes from something called graphite, and it is the thinnest two-dimensional layer within graphite. And as you stack them, you then get fewer layer graphene. As long as you uh, you you keep stacking, you'll lose the properties of graphene, starting with leaving two D graphene. So then you say, well, at some point, it's no longer pristine because it's it now has the properties of graphite, which, 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 uh, if you've used the graphite pencil, you press on it and it breaks. Graphene stronger than diamond doesn't break. Well, at the two dimensional level, there's not going to be much breakage from the three dimensional world because, because the three D world can really not break into the two D world with it, all of its powers, right? So the two D world has its own sets of mathematical formulas. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense, right? So, so remember, graphene stacked as a two-dimensional model over and over again eventually becomes fuel layer graphene, and then eventually becomes graphite. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just as bad, just as useful as a pencil. Yeah, just as useful as a pencil. Well, graphite has other uses, like they can sure. put it around nuclear reactors. They can can, can do things like uh, use it as a as a lubricant um, for uh, uh, you know machine parts. Uh, but now, or locks, but in outer space, the graphite doesn't work. That's why it gets replaced by um, molybdenum disulfide, MOLY S2. MOS2 is the replacement for graphite in outer space um, lubrication. And um, by the way, there's a story behind that too. Uh, in the old Anaconda mines of in in, uh, in Montana, there used to be, that's how they found all this copper 
But one day the copper runs out. And so the mine's abandoned until a person comes along. He actually paves roads uh, for a living and he made a you know, name for himself doing that. But then he, um, he, uh, he, he ends up following some chemist talking about the value of molybdenum disulfide. And he buys the old anaconda mine infrastructure, um, and um, and then and then and then because he bought buys it so cheap and the infrastructure is there, um, basically when when the world starts realizing the value of MOS two in the usage for outer space uh, lubricity and things like that, then um, the amount of molybdenum in in the in the uh, in the old mine, shot him into uh, one of the wealthiest. He basically he became a billionaire uh, through that acquisition. How interesting! Okay. Yeah, wow. Right, he's now eighty nine years old. He was born in nineteen thirty four. Um, people say, well, according to Forbes, if you believe Forbes, um, his net worth is seven billion. Well, if you calculate molybdenum and how far it ran up. Um, you basically can see that um, uh, Mr. Dennis Washington, American industrialist, becomes billionaire because of one single material and one move. I mean, yes, he had to have the money to buy these things, but it was the decision in doing that and the rise of uh, molybdenum disulfide, which is a two-dimensional material unto itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's another 2D material. Very, very interesting. In fact, it could be stacked with graphene to make um, um, 2D machines and other parts. Um, but that's another uh, adventure. But if we go into this adventure, he becomes a billionaire from the uh, from the millionaire level because um, you know, just think about it. If something goes uh, is priced at uh, you know very, very cheap, and then suddenly everyone realizes the importance of outer space, not just like some people think outer space is going to discover another planet, which is, that's the ultimate ultimate, but you shoot for the uh, stars and you land on the moon, or you just land on the surface of the earth's atmosphere and you build a laboratory right there. Suddenly you no longer need the escape velocity to leave the earth and everything you make using these two dimensional materials, which is very light to, to add into your, your rockets going up, your, your shuttles going up. And then as you assemble things that you accumulate from the uh, capturing things that come near the earth um, and you assemble new materials, suddenly those materials to send them back to earth, is very easy. You just drop it back down to the planet. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so dream with me on things like that. I'm going to bring you much, much closer to a, a dream that made it into the nature paper regarding something around... Imagine if we could detect viruses and bacteria faster, like so fast that it transforms everything that you do. Um, mm -hmm. And for our purposes, you know, we got involved with this because I was talking about goose and then you said that your greatest adventure was eating lamb over the holidays, right? And I shared with you, I had lamb with the eyeballs inside the head of the lamb and that was roasted inside... Uh, inside one of the cities in Greece and graphene brought me there, which is another adventure for graphene um, and, and food, by the way. But it was incredible what was going on in Greece because it was the American Cancer Society um, and all the other international cancer societies all conglomerating into uh, Mykonos, uh, Santorini and Athens, right? And, and this was my first time ever in Greece. And it was a, bit, a time I would never forget. Um, and cancer is such a difficult uh, thing to conquer because the cancer wants to live just as much as you want the cancer out and you want to live. But it's a competition between two opposing life forces. Yeah. Right? That's stuck inside you. And I'm describing it in a poetic way that it was described to me. Mm -hmm. And... Why was it held in Greece? Because Greece is the center of philosophy. And so it was It was speaking about cancer poetry, basically. And I was invited because in the country of Portugal, um, a few scientists and myself had successfully attached graphene, reactive graphene, 
to, so if we had to make it reactive and then attach it to an antibody that then could target the cancer because the antibody knows where to go. Antibodies are already pre-programmed to attach to an antigen. Yeah. So if you now attach the graphene to that, now it has the capability of heating up so that it, the theory of cooking your cancer to a, a, a temperature like you cook your, you will cook other people's cancers all the time or other animals cancer all the time because or other vegetables cancers all the time because when you cook your food, you're, you're cooking things, right? So while you don't have to raise it to that temperature, you could generate a slightly higher temperature than 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6 Fahrenheit and trigger uh, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death or, an, or, an, or an, a necrosis, which is, you know, another kind of uh, breakdown. And then the the um, the threat is is decreased and diminished and and uh, an incredible application of graphene. Wow! We published this. Yeah, we published this. We showed um, that the can the skin cancer, the melanoma, was completely eliminated. The problem was getting the um, antibody library to do more, um, getting more sponsorship, and then the many distractions you'd have in doing 19th century graphene type stuff. Right? So, so what I just described to you was, was um, you know, if you're going to touch, touch on cancer, the amount of funding you'd need is, you know, it, although it's not as much as what we need for the space station, um, the, that example I gave in the last podcast with you, but um, we don't need $12 billion, but we need something, you know, sig significant, right? This is not... Um, this is not small. And the antibody library, um, I mean, there's so many antibodies. So how do you know which one does what? And they all do different things with the graphene. And there's so many different types of graphene you could attach to it. Uh, and then and then you could even add a spacer in between the graphene and the target. So I, I now want to flash forward with you. Mm -hmm. We're going to do some time travel to 2020. And 2020 was the year right after 2019. And that's why it's called COVID-19 because COVID-19 appeared in 2019 um, and wrecked the whole world. And by 2020, there's a paper in, the, in, 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 you know, in, in Nature, which is one of the top prized um, academic journals. And, um, and as I share this with you, I want to send to, your, to our, our chat box here, our, our WhatsApp um, mm -hmm. sharing. I'm just giving you the link so you can uh, read it with me. Okay. Right? So here it is. The title is Graphene Functionalized Field Effect Transistors for Ultra Sensitive Detection of Japanese Encephalitis and Avian Influenza Virus. What a title. <laughs> right. What Can a title. You translate right? that. What did what does that mean? <laughs> okay. So graphene functionalized means that the it it now has the graphene has the ability to do chemistry. Prior to that, pristine graphene will not be chemically reactive, so there's no chemistry. But if the chemistry were to happen with graphene, it would take your organic chemistry and your and your inorganic chemistry, if you're a chemistry major, by the way, um, then it would put all those um, to a whole nother level because you'd say, but that's not what I studied, right? Okay. I didn't study that in my undergraduate chemistry degree about this because back then, when those textbooks were written, they, we didn't know. And we're still finding out things about graphene uh, long after I entered the field in 2010, 20, 2009, 2010, right? And last podcast, we ended with Robert R. Meredith and we we're talking about counterfeit money and how graphene could help solve that problem so that we, we don't have counterfeit money. But is that such a good deal when we could have, we could solve counterfeit using Bitcoin? Right, we could we could do all kinds of things. We could sell, solve counterfeit using gold, right? Although although that there's many competitions and choices, but now we have graphene functionalized, so reactive graphene field effect trans transistor. So basically, this transistor it can allow you to detect two particular threats to humanity. And abstracts are great. So now we're going to go into the abstract, which describes the first line says graphene is a two-dimensional nanomaterial, just like MOS2, moly molybdenum disulfide, has gained immense interest in biosensing applications, meaning that 
this, this, if it makes it in nature, every sentence is worth its weight in gold, right? So yep. it has already shown that this is possible due to its large surface to volume ratio and excellent electrical properties. Hmm. So we're not highlighting graphene is stronger than diamond and, 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 you know, steel and, and you know, we're not highlighting that we're highlighting its electrical properties and surface to volume ratio, which is makes sense because if it's two dimensional, think about a piece yeah, of paper, volume right? Zero. Yeah. Right. It's you're right. You have, yeah, exactly. You have a volume of zero, right? So, spoken so much like someone who studies math, which <laughs> I love, right? I have to pause to, you know, let your uh, statement roll into my mouth and into my, all the cells of my brain, right? The volume of zero. If you divide anything by zero, right, you're going to have this massive number. So as long as we're close to zero, right, we're going to have massive S to V, right? Now, here in a compact and user-friendly graphene field effect transistor called the Graphet, based ultra sensitive because it's it's like it's built like that. It's ultra sensitive, no no blockage from the uh, signals and from the noise because of the high surface to volume ratio has been developed. So has been, meaning we've already achieved this for detecting Japanese encephalitis virus, the mm -hmm. JEV. Now, I don't know about you, but have you had any um, uh, experience with the JEV? No, I have not. No, right? Okay. So, so it's the leading cause of a vaccine preventable encephalitis in Asia. Uh, and what is this? This is a Flavi virus, which is closely related to West Nile or the St. Louis encephalitis uh, virus. Okay. And um, this, uh, the JE virus is transmitted to humans through the bite of an infected mosquito. Okay. Now, could you imagine like in a movie, if we were talking about how these mosquitoes that are infectious bite these humans and then they, um, they all get this, they all, they all get sick. Mm -hmm. And then, and then because mosquitoes are biting more humans, that's what they do. Then maybe they carry it to other, other humans and it spreads all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Provided you go into Asia and we were describing, you know, we pay you 450,000 euros. And then would you do it right to go to Asia, right? To get this. And all this, by the way, is on the CDC website. Um, but that this is a, this is a, a threat, right? Okay. Now, after you, how many, get, around how many people does this affect out of interest? Well, you know, it's, it's um in Asia, it, it's, it's different, right? But let me describe to you why it's so catastrophic because, because it's um it, it targets your brain. Okay. So then it causes your brain tissues to be inflamed. Ooh. Right. So while we don't know much about the, you know, uh, you know this this problem um, here in this in the North America, um, you know, with with climate change, maybe the risk uh, changes, the risk profile changes. That's why I didn't give you the number because the number is so low that it's not, you know, we shouldn't worry about this, right? It's only yeah. if you go camping and trekking and you know, and there's like pools of water everywhere. Well, no, no, no problem, right? But, but it's called the Japanese encephalitis virus because encephalitis is inflammation of the of the, of the brain, and yeah. then Japanese because you probably found it in Japan, right? Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then, but what happens if it starts spreading? Mm. You know, yeah. There's there's all kinds of like freaky things that most people don't think about, like for example, mold. Mold doesn't usually infect people like like the bread, the, the mold on your bread or things like that. But, you know, it, it does break things down. Okay. It's a saprophyte, right? So it breaks things down. But what if these saprophytes decided that they don't want to eat bread anymore and they wanted to have some brain? Oh, yeah. This is a, a nice lead in into Films. Right, right. You know, you you're, you study math, so you don't. You're going to just look at the uh, the probability of this. But but I'm telling you that if this thing were to want, if if the temperatures warmed up and bread was no longer, um, just like if we, we talked about ten billion people and all the, them all wanting to have steak instead of chicken or, or or corn, suddenly your your your, you know, things can shift. And I I want to use something really simple. Is remember the Rolex watch. And then there was also something called the um, the swatch, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. 
both of them cannot out compete with the um with the apple watch okay yeah and so when the apple watch came about right yeah. it was the end it was the beginning of the end for some of these i mean they'd have to sell it on something else but but now it's like you can't even tell me what the weather is like rolex or swatch right you can't do that so why do i want you Right, so now you have a difficult thing to explain: Japanese encephalitis virus, or or mold now wanting to eat humans, human brains. I mean, I mean, we are I, like I remember I was sharing about being silly, because we want to come up with things that 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 then cause us to become very excited. Now, Dennis Washington, by the way, is is not a silly story. He's really an American billionaire who became a billionaire through uh, one of his major moves was this molybdenum disulfide that nobody was even looking for in the 1800s, 1900s uh, during the copper mining days. But they built all this infrastructure and all he came in was he bought it for a song. Really? And then shot himself to a billionaire status and he didn't even study chemistry. So, so you know, then you say, well, what? Why are these scientists, right? I, I sent you the link. Why are they studying the JEV? And the other thing was the AIV, which is the avian influenza virus. And if you notice that today's podcast, we started with me sharing about the goose for Thanksgiving and, and, and Christmas. And the goose is a bird. Um, and it just happens to be that this year and last year, the avian influenza virus has gone crazy. You actually had a shortage of eggs in some states in the United States. Wow. Yeah. And people with bird feeders, did you ever imagine a bird feeder would, would be the vector, the contaminant where this bird is infected, but while this bird is feeding, infects all these other birds around it. So these bird feeders are actually a terrible thing. They're very dangerous. And the next time you see a robin, think of the avian influenza virus and a robin. Right. And and any bird that has any droppings and comes from the wild, comes near your domestic chicken, infects your chicken, and now you have a house and a farm and you have thousands of you know chickens because you're selling your chickens and they're all infected now. That's yeah. what happened this year, 2023. And, and yeah. in this paper, then I guess, can you talk a little bit just say, I mean, so how did graphene then, you know, be introduced into these, into this, you know, kind of vector spread um, virus? Because if you knew that, if you know that there's something going on, and I'm, I'm going to go a stretch here, is that with graphite, you could suddenly be able to detect, um, you know, that's not what this paper is, is for as far as products, but I'm just going to give you a leap into a product is imagine you would, as a, as someone who loves bird watching, and you're putting out your bird feeder, you would suddenly be able to tell, wait a minute, things aren't right. And you send all your data into the CDC and they're able to tell this is spreading really fast, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got, we got a quarantine this whole area. We got, in fact, all the farmers, if it's heading, uh, heading east, all the farmers in California, like in Nevada and also Arizona, what we got to do is you got to keep all your birds indoors. We got we got to let the, the the flock that the infected flock the Canadian geese or whatever the migration patterns are well let it pass before we we let our um our 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 birds out again to uh to, and, and, you know to be um to be in, we don't want them infected so a detector has all these capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, and no, I I mean the the uses of graphene are so vast. I remember you kind of discussing its you know capability of, of of kind of you know removing oil from water even you know through graphene sponges right um yeah. and i guess you know how that can be applied in you know the large industrial sense but maybe even biologically as well would that be something that's possible has that been a product at all well i'm going to share with you the paper that i sent you the introduction section says the development of point of care poc disease detection kits providing ultra sensitive selective and rapid advances in recent times. In this article, we have focused on graphene-based biosensors for the detection of two different viruses by detecting their respective viral antigen um, and those two viruses we talked about. So do you imagine there's nothing that's going to be this, this quickly? 
And now the JEV they describe belongs to the family of flaviviruses and exists in a zoonotic cycle between the vector mosquito, while humans are the dead end host due to low and short-lived viremia of the JEV. Most infections are asymptomatic, so you can't even tell. However, the case fatality rate amongst those with encephalitis is as high as one out of every three, they, they, and, more, and higher even in children. It causes clinical symptoms in humans, including a nonspecific fever, illness, meningitis, encephalitis, and meningoencephalitis. Pigs play an important role and serve as an amplifier and have a natural infection rate of 98 to 100%. So when you ask me the question about human beings, I didn't answer you regarding humans because what it would do is it would diminish the outcome or the important impact is 98 to 100% in pigs. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, right? So, so, so that's why, and then so the JEV is incurable and the vaccination is not foolproof. Okay. Um, an early di diagnosis is critical in preventing an epidemic outbreak, especially since the initial symptoms are usually mistaken during clinical diagnosis for dengue or malaria. So the conventional diagnostic methods for JEV, such as the ELISA test, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, RT-PCR, reverse transcription loop-mediated isothermal amplification, RT-LAMP, and Luminex technology, plaque re reduction, and you keep going on the list, are costly and it's time-consuming diagnostic assay procedures that require bulky equipment and even trained personnel. Remember that how you, like, if only people, anybody could use this. Well, this is how, yeah. this is how graphene fat, graph fat would change the outcome of this. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah, no. And, and where do you, where do you see the future of this going? Do you see this totally kind of revolutionizing the kind of vaccine industry or, um, what do you kind of think the future of medicine could look like, you know, with considering you know, the powers of reactive graphene? <laughs> you know, it's just so interesting because we just had the Israel Hamas war go on and, and, and most people read about it for, as a, as an outsider. I was in Israel, just like I was in Greece and in Israel, they wanted nothing more than graphene focused on the um the emergency situation of contaminated water or if the surrounding countries had a bioweapon okay they were so worried about my status that they actually um made sure that my passport did not indicate that i was in israel they made extra measures for me um when i went there so i i have pictures to, you know to 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 uh to highlight that i was there this wasn't dreaming i even brought um people with me and we presented this um of why graphene materials um because of the electric uh electric capability and, and other capabilities of graphene um we could create surfaces that were smart surfaces you wouldn't have to clean them like if you imagine cleaning the surfaces um how, was it clean? Do you remember if you clean? Like imagine counting dollars and then someone's talking with you. Wait a minute, 5,501, 5,602. Well, you might have forgotten the hundred every now and then because you're counting. You cannot rely on human error when there is a massive spread of something with high virality. And, and so so that that is, we learned that through COVID mm -hmm. because- COVID never went away. It went inside the deer. If you type in uh, wild deer and COVID, you know it, you you end up seeing National Geo Geographic end up releasing data sets around the deer now have it. Now it's not our problem. It's yeah. in the deer. But what happens if it comes back into our lives? Oh God forbid! <laughs> right, we know what it did to us. Right, so so we but it did bring a lot of people together. Right, it brought them so much together. What you know, the interesting thing about our podcast is that I started the podcast off with philosophy. Mm -hmm. Right, it was almost like a philosophy podcast, like Miles and other approaches. And then now we're into the thick of graphene, um, and but graphene and philosophy are interlinked. And I mentioned that in 2014. In fact, it's it's a pub it's on public record. I say that. 
graphene is doomed until the next generation grows up. Okay. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So you are the next generation. Yes. No. Yeah. I did not know you in 2014. How old were you then? <laughs> I was 12. <laughs> you were 12. Oh my gosh. It, uh, what, what would I be doing with you in, when you were 12? And you wouldn't be podcasting out of uh, out of the innovation labs at Harvard, right? Um, I, I, hope not. I told you, you know, <laughs> we should start talking now because you're you're deeply needed in the future. See, the adults of the time, that was me included, we we had a trillion dollars to spend in graphene to go investigate all the things it could do, and boy, did we investigate. Mm -hmm. We found things, we found a lot of things that graphene couldn't do. We even found that putting graphene together with graphene would make graphite, but you know that now easily, right? So, so we made a lot of mistakes, a lot of bad product. Um, and, um, and I, I was busy looking at something really peculiar, which is if we skipped the mining process in graphite and took natural graphite, we could get the largest surface area that the earth makes naturally. And then we could have the greatest surface area to volume ratio, which would matter if you're trying to do certain projects, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And assuming that it's not zero, right? Because dividing many by zero, you don't get anything. But if we assumed it's a very small number, but it's a fixed number, then Something suddenly towards. it starts ma to matter that how big the, the starting surface was. And if you crush the graphite, think of teeth. Teeth are very strong vertically, but if you did diagonal forces or, or horizontal forces, your, your teeth wouldn't hold up very well. Yeah. So graphite, same thing, right? It's, it's very strong on the layer of graphene, the direction of graphene, but it's like a deck of cards. And imagine very strong cards, but the deck is slippery and it just slides. And when you break a pencil, that's what you're breaking. You're breaking the sliding forces of that and not breaking the graphene. I see. Okay, yeah. that's a really helpful analogy. But I guess, Dr. Chu, thank you so much. I think on that note, we might wrap up today's episode. Mm -hmm. Is there anything further you'd like to add or mention? No, I think that um, we just uh, we will just have more discussions on the exploration of graphene. And I look forward to those. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for listening to another episode of Calling All Explorers. To find out more, please visit fingra.com. That is P-H-E-N-E-G-R-A dot com. Thank you.